at first, yeah, there was a lot of friction and that was, it's tough to find the line of, okay, when are we business Chris and Lizzie and when are we, you know, Chris and Lizzie who love each other. And I was better at that at times than Chris because he would think, you know, if I got upset about something work related, he would take it very personally. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm not yelling at you, the person I'm yelling at the stupid thing you did on <laughs> in this email, you know, don't don't get so upset about it if you can. And it it requires a lot of good communication at the end of the day to talk about this thing that you did upset me or, you know, at five o'clock, we don't talk about work anymore. We're just a couple right now. And we really have to actively try to not talk about work. And uh, you have to be clear about those. I want to say deadlines, but I don't think that's the right word. Those boundaries, lines. boundaries, boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hey there, welcome to another edition, another episode of the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky. I am John Santiago. Every other week, I interview content creators about their stories, strategies, and experience of building an online audience through video. Travel, lifestyle, filmmaking, and so much more. That, in a nutshell, summarizes the content of this week's guest, Toronto-based creator Lizzie Pierce. Across YouTube, Instagram, and a variety of other platforms, Lizzie has amassed an audience of more than 300,000 followers. And through her content, she aims to inspire hopeful creators to take the leap into the world of creativity while providing them actionable advice for how to do so. As a creator, Lizzie has been able to partner with well-known brands, including Adobe and Storyblocks, and she's also leveraged her work to co-create Know How Media, a production business with her husband and fellow YouTuber Chris Howe. Now, in this episode of the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky, we travel across the map with Lizzie and discuss a variety of topics, including the surprising similarities between between running a business as a creator and the preparation that goes into planning a wedding. Lizzie actually got married in 2021 to Chris, so we chatted about that to kick off the conversation. Co-owning a media company with your significant other. And what keeps her motivated when challenges arise for her as a creator? That and so much more on this episode of the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky. want to remind all of you before we jump into the conversation, conversation if you haven't already make sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever it is that you get your podcast we're available on spotify apple podcasts all over the board there and if you enjoy this episode make sure to you know go ahead and leave a review for us on apple podcasts or wherever it is that you can leave reviews for podcasts we love to hear from people about your feedback you know regarding the show so feel free to do that there so without further ado let's go ahead and jump into my conversation with lizzie pierce lizzie pierce thank you hello. for joining me on this episode hello there Thanks Help, for thank you for joining me. me yeah thank you so much for joining me on this episode of the video craft show presented by Video Husky. It is a pleasure to to finally have you on. You know, I, you're a very busy woman and rightfully so because you you're an incredible filmmaker, photographer, videographer. I mean, you you do it all. So, you know, I know thank you've got you so a busy much. schedule. So, I thank you for, you know, taking the time. Thank you for having me. I mean, I think everyone is says they're busy these days. Everybody's busy, but it's it's uh, definitely a unique industry I'm in, in terms of timing and attempting to plan and organize yourself. Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to talk to you about that, obviously. We're, we're, we're going to get into quite a lot here. For sure. But you've had a busy... Well, you had a busy last year. I mean, first of all, I didn't get to tell you this yeah. before we hopped on, but congratulations because you and your your now husband you got married last year, and yeah, I, I watched I watched the vlogs on that, and it was it looked like oh, a fun little wet yeah, it looked like a fun little wedding event that you you all had. Yeah, it was great. We were supposed to have. I mean, now we're technically having. I mean, this sounds kind of bougie, two weddings, but uh, <laughs> originally it was supposed to be last summer, and yeah. when everything with COVID happened. And we figured, you know, this could keep going on and on until we can have, you know, 80 people all together. Let's mm -hmm. just let's get married. We plan on getting married. We were already engaged. Also, everyone should know for a few years before that. 
Chris and I have been together for a total of 10 years. It'll be this summer. So we were like, okay, you know, we, we would kind of like to be married now. Could we just have the party later? So yeah. we had a small ceremony at my family cottage, ordered a dress online, you know, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, because we couldn't really go shopping for one. And yeah, it, it was really great. And so that was our, our legal ceremony. We had a nice dinner and, um, with some of our, our closest friends, really just our bridal party and our parents. Yeah. And, uh, and this summer, fingers crossed, we'll be having, technically it'll be a vow renewal. I suppose, but yeah. it'll be the the party with our, our entire family. So we're really looking forward to that. And that's going to be a bigger, that's going to have more people. Like what is the, what's like yeah. the guest, guest list that you're anticipating for that event? I mean, I, I specifically picked a venue that could only take 80 people okay. because I wanted it to, I didn't want it to be massive. I still want it to be close family because I know what happens. If you get a venue where it can have 200 people and you say you're going to have 100, it ends up being 200. And I'm like, who? I don't know 200 people. You know, I don't want my, you know, my mom's friend's daughter's cousin coming who I've never met. And that already starts to happen with 80 people. And so you have to, you know, some people may not be happy that they can't bring their new boyfriend, but you know, I don't know your new boyfriend, so <laughs> that is not my problem. <laughs> that's like, that's one thing for me. I know we're starting off on a bit of a tangent here, but this is really that's interesting okay. to me about like people getting married. I went to a couple weddings last year myself and they were all small too. And, you know, they were a yeah. hundred people max. But I, I think that I, I would think that, uh, you know, planning the guest list is one of the hardest things because is there not is. a part of you that feels like, Mm, am I being kind of mean here by leaving certain people, especially with your wet, your, yeah. the wedding that you had last year that was just very intimate with like the closest friends and family that you had? You had to be very selective there with that. Yeah. I think it, I'm a very practical person. Um, mm-hmm. I was raised by very, especially my father, very practical, very straightforward. So I think that's kind of how I'm approaching it. And thinking of, I mean, and the selfish side of it, it is your day. So it should be what you want. Um, mm-hmm. I knew it was right to have mostly family there. And so I have a large family. So I capped it at aunts, uncles, and first cousins because I have mm-hmm. second cousins. I have third yeah. cousins. People have yeah. children. <laughs> and so I said, you know, no children, immediate, immediate family, full stop. And that was, that's my rule. And because it, 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 you have to make some kind of rule or someone's going to get offended. If you let one person bring their kid, someone else is going to want to bring their kid. If one person right. brings their boyfriend, someone else is going to want to bring their boyfriend. Yep. So we said, you know, you're engaged or living together. <laughs> and then, <laughs> you know, that's, that's the rule. It's, it's close. We only have 80 people. It's, it's close family only. And I mean, we did do an initial count of like, who is our, you know, how many people are in our family? How many people does that equate to? And we looked for a venue. Like if we picked a venue that had 40 people, then obviously that would have been a huge problem because then cousins were going to be left out. Um, you can't have one cousin and not another cousin. That doesn't really make mm-hmm. a whole lot of sense. So um, we definitely picked a venue that we knew could fit everyone and no no add-ons, <laughs> no <Yeah>. plus randoms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And my mom is more the sensitive one about that. <laughs> Really? Why is that? Why is that the case? Uh, she, I mean, I think it's just a personality type thing. She mm-hmm. doesn't want to offend anyone. And it's important to her that everybody else has fun. And for me, you know, it's we're the ones paying for it and picking everything. And it's yeah. our wedding. So I think we should be the ones enjoying it. And everyone who wants to celebrate can come. You know, it should be yes. the food that... We want to serve everyone, not that I'm hoping everybody likes. You know, it is a factor. Obviously, I'm not going to play, like, I wouldn't play screamo music knowing that my, you know, aunt, my senior aunt and uncle would be there. I'm going to yeah. play something nice that I think people enjoy. But I think it's your wedding. You should, your opinion is the most important. And my mother is also helping to pay for it. So her opinion is second most important. And then everybody right. else just, if you want to come, come. If you don't want to come because it's not your thing. No hard feelings. 
Yeah. That's, Just don't that's, take it too seriously. That's what it seems like sometimes with certain weddings, especially really big weddings. It becomes about more than just a couple, which unfortunately, you know, yeah. that's what it should be ultimately about because it's a celebration of you and, and your husband and, and, and your partnership with each other. But then when you have these big weddings yeah. and of course, when there's stakes involved with your parents, maybe, you know, pay, putting some money into it, other family members and whatnot, then it, then it starts to get a little bit warped, which is why I think yeah. eventually if one day I get married, I will probably just do something very, very tiny. That's without... why a lot of people do that because it's, yeah. it gets too stressful. And I completely understand why that's, you know, we would have, we talked about doing that, um, mm-hmm. but ultimately I knew not doing something larger would be upsetting for many family members. I knew not having anything at all would be more upsetting for them. And I do want my aunts. I'm close with my aunts and my cousins. And I did. I do want them there. And it was unfortunate we couldn't do it the first time around. But as long as there's something, I think people can, you know, just pretend. I'll still be wearing a dress. You know, we'll we'll write another set of vows. It's the same thing. You know, (laughs) it's and we're not a incredibly religious family either so that's Mm -hmm. also something to note so for us it's the legal part of the wedding not really as much the spiritual part of the wedding so um our yeah we're we're looking forward to it we're looking forward to having the big party but it's a lot of work and we have a wedding planner and i'm still finding it to be a lot of work (laughs) wow even with a wedding planner it's still it's still tough to to manage all of it well then that's one of the things i wanted to to segue into is just how do you how do you how did you plan a wedding while still also running your business and doing all nah. the work that you do on YouTube? Like what? Because I remember in that video, I think you had mentioned at one point, you were like, ah, I'm, I'm kind of having a panic attack here. I, I want to call this thing off and yeah. like not do it, do it anymore. I mean, how were you able to juggle all of that going on? Yeah, the first one in some ways was more stressful. And I'm sure things will come up for this one closer to that are also stressful. You need to ask for help and realize that everything doesn't have to be perfect. There's a lot of pressure that I think everyone puts on themselves to, especially with weddings that you've been envisioning, especially if you're another woman, you've been envisioning for a long time, you know, Mm -hmm. what that's going to be like. It's a big deal. But take some of that pressure off and think, you know, what is it really going to matter if I don't pick the perfect cup? Is it really going to matter if I don't have, if I arrive that day and there's more of this flower than another flower? And if something Mm -hmm. goes wrong, you know, what is, what are my most important things about that day that matter to me and focus on that? And then everything else kind of isn't as important. And I'm, I'm the only way things get done. I remember talking to our friend Peter McKinnon about this and big name drop there (laughs) yeah well i remember him talking about it he was he was like you just have to operate on a higher level when Mm. there's more going on that and you have to be really decisive it also helps when you're working with a slightly bigger budget i won't lie money Mm -hmm. in that sense with weddings and planning does make things easier because you're going who's going to pick this up and drop it off pay the delivery fee you know (laughs) if you can do that yeah you don't have to think about you don't have to think about those things that you know they're they're like five dollar questions it's like cool just pay it off like i'm not gonna stress you won't regret that that part exactly Mm -hmm. and if there's Ways to save money, like with paper invitations, we thought, oh my gosh, that's going to be a couple thousand dollars. Forget that. I'll do it online. And so we have a website. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we're doing it all through. I think the site's called withjoy.com or something, and we can keep uh-huh. everything and monitor everything there. And that that was a cost that we were able to cut. But being decisive, like I picked our, our uh, plates and cutlery and glasses for this upcoming wedding just one evening by myself. And Chris went and I said, do you care? Do you want to make the decision with me? He said, nope, I don't care. I said, great. It'll be these three done. (laughs) And you just don't second guess it. I tell my wedding planners, send me three options of places to look at. I'll look at all three and I will pick based on those because I know what's going to be. The flowers were important of having a good florist. And I really want food that food that people are going to enjoy. Um, But again, I wasn't I, I told our wedding planner what we wanted and she sent us great options and then I trust her. So it, it not micromanaging and giving and same thing with my business, giving our employees the freedom to, 
you know, Josh is over here. We've made a list of we're going through an edit right now. And I said, OK, you're going to look for this kind of thing, but I'm I'm trusting you to do it. And I, I don't have time to micromanage. Uh, so you need to find people that can do a good job and also trust them to do a good job. And if it's not perfect, you know, people are doing their best and also just manage your expectations and enjoy whatever you have at the end of the day. Um, and then you'll always be happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the secret. And it's and it's interesting as I was hearing you talk about all of these things associated with planning your wedding, I was like, this also sounds a lot like running probably the same kind of mentality that you have when it comes to running your business, which you you tied mm-hmm. that loose end for me there at the <laughs> at the end there. Um Yeah, so there's yeah. two sides of everything. Yeah, and I I I wonder uh, have you ever thought like, wow, you know, I'm glad I actually started a business because it it actually prepared me to to manage the stress and and deal with all the things that come with planning a wedding because there's a lot of overlap yeah. there it sounded like yeah absolutely there are pros and cons to running your own business and mm-hmm. you know working at another i'll say 9 to 5 or working for someone else i think all the time how would someone who works at a normal 9 to 5 right now be able to plan their wedding as well, because that also Mm -hmm. sounds, I at least have the luxury of, I don't get in trouble if I answer a wedding related email midday. I don't, no one's going to give me a hassle if I I have a wedding dress appointment at four o'clock today, I have to leave early for it. But it doesn't mean I'm doing any less work. That time, like thing, everything still has to get done somehow, whether I'm working later one night or starting earlier on Friday, which I think I'll have to. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm working through the weekend because I'm going to an event. It all evens out. So the one luxury I do have is I can move things around in my schedule however I see fit. But I, at the same time, I need to make sure I'm giving myself time off. And one thing I've learned from doing this for a long time is that it does even out. Uh, So don't beat yourself up if you do have to leave at four one day, because chances are, if you have a deadline that you need to meet, it'll have to get done anyways. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You will find that time later on. I didn't even think about how I was going to make up that hour, but I'm looking at my schedule right now and I'm realizing, oh yeah, I'm working this entire weekend because I have to go to a a conference. So I don't really have a choice. And that is a lot more than just an hour. Yeah, it, it, it's, it all, it all works itself out, but you do have to, um, kind of f- figure it out on your own and and what's going to work for you. There are a lot of pros and cons to running your own business. That's all I really have to say. It's, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard, but you uh, you figure it out. Well, what makes it gratifying for you? What What is the thing that w- in those moments when it does get hard to say, plan out a YouTube video, plan out shots that you want for a YouTube video, What is what is the thing that kind of keeps you keeps you going in you know th- those times when it it gets a bit difficult and you and you may question yourself it's funny because i think a lot of people have been going through that this year especially if you live in toronto and you know we basically kicked off the new year with new lockdown regulations um, so that that yeah. was definitely a downer and i think everyone and including myself suffers from some degree of mental health issues. And so normally when I'm not feeling motivated to work or to move forward or inspired or what have you, it's usually something involving that, that I need to manage. Things that help me kind of get back on track are structure, including, you know, setting a start time and an end time to my workday, giving myself time to myself to Mm -hmm. read or especially exercise, eating well, because I find if my diet suffers, then that in turn will affect my mental health. You don't even realize it happening until it's too late and in turn with exercise as well. Um, so I kind of get my my body and my brain in check. And then if I'm doing all of those things right and I'm still not feeling motivated or something – got me down or something didn't work out the way I wanted it to at work, then you you really just have to evaluate that situation. And if say it's, I mean, it's situational, 
But if something really gets you down and didn't work out the way you wanted it to, yeah, it's it's decide whether that matters or not. I mean, a lot of things go wrong. You fail left, right, and center, but it's not mm. really the failure itself that you learn from. It's what you do when you pick yourself back up and you keep going. If you stop right there, you haven't really learned anything at all. Failing isn't where you actually learn something. It's what it, it's what comes after that. Do mm-hmm. you try again? Do you pivot? Do you, you know, outsource or, you know, what's, what's the solution and how you can do something different next time? You know, I mm-hmm. launched merch for the first time this year and did it reach, reach my expectations of what it sold? Some of them did. Some of them didn't. I have no idea how to sell clothing. I have never yeah. done this before. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have never produced physical products. Every day I'm waking up and I'm figuring out there's something new I have to do with this business that I've never, I'm still 29. I'm figuring it out every day, but that doesn't mm-hmm. mean I, I haven't learned a lot. I'm not good at my craft and it doesn't mean I can't learn more going forward. Every business owner encounters similar problems. So it's a matter of getting help, outsourcing, getting mentors, and evaluating what it is you really want to do work-wise What's your passion? Who are you actually trying to serve? And also, if you're running your own business, usually it's what's kind of what kind of lifestyle do you want? And is, you know, whatever that has disappointed you, why has that disappointed you? And is there something you can change to make it work for you? That's the the joy and the beauty of uh, owning your own business. It's It's just so exciting to be able to work for yourself and to be in have that much control. And I'm a person who likes control. <laughs> <laughs> Has that always been the case for you? Like going back to a young age? Yeah, I was definitely I got made fun of in school for being kind of a keener. And uh, <laughs> when I was really young, I always knew from a young age, I wanted to do something creative. I wanted to like my job. And I knew I wanted to be the boss. Mm-hmm. Those were the the three things that were <laughs> important is I wanted to enjoy it. And I wanted I knew I liked being in charge. I'm not great at I I like making the decisions and it gives you more um, ownership and excitement when you get to be in control of your your future and your work. It's fun. Well, I I wonder too how, you know, something that came to mind as you were talking about that, about being somebody who wanted to be your own boss at a very young age. I'm curious about how your, your thoughts and your perceptions about running a company or just being a boss have changed over time? Because I imagine when you were younger, you might have had a certain idea around what that looked like. And then now that you've actually had the experience of managing people, running your own business, running your own company, you've learned a lot. Like Certain things that Mm -hmm. you thought to be true are now, they, they may have proven not to be true. And things that you didn't think were part of the role are actually part of the role. So I'm curious about that. Yeah. I mean, if if we're going way back when I knew I wanted to be quote unquote the boss, I thought I would be working in more of a traditional corporate setting. I would still have higher ups, but I would be one of the higher ups, if that makes sense. Mm. I would, I would be working. I, I never, I don't know if I ever knew I would be starting something from the ground up. And so when that opportunity presented itself, I mean, social media when I was a kid didn't really exist. So it developed as I was growing up. Instagram only came into play when I was gradu in my last year of university. Yeah. So I couldn't imagine myself in the job that I'm in because it it was only just starting to exist. And that's kind of why I have this feeling now of always being you're, you feel ahead and you feel behind in some ways because I'm always playing this game of catch up. How can I differentiate? How can I make sure that I last on this platform? How can I make sure that I'm maximizing what I'm able to do right now through this business? How can I, how can I grow it? It's, it's some new things that we're learning every single day. I think when running your own business, a lot of people immediately see the uncertainty and the vulnerability it gives you Mm -hmm. because, I mean, especially financially. But I also didn't realize how many strengths it would offer at the same time. And I'm talking in this situation about like job security and financial security. Mm -hmm. 
I think a lot of our our family members, for example, they look at you and they go, oh, you're working for yourself. How are you going to figure that out? You know, how are you going to manage that? What's going to happen? You know, especially that was everyone's first question during COVID is, what are you going to do? And not, and I don't say this in a way to brag, but just to paint a full picture during COVID, our businesses have never done better. Like it mm. was, it was our, for my business and Chris's business, it was some of our best years yet. And was that due to COVID? No, I think it was just the natural growth of our business. But we were very fortunate to not that it didn't really impact us or the security of our employees' jobs at all. And so when we're hiring, I think some people who aren't necessarily familiar with how the business works or the structure of it or how we're able to make money or how we're able to keep this thing floating, especially during a worldwide pandemic, they think, you know, is my job secure? Does this make sense for me? Is this the right decision? And what what our employees and we've come to realize is our jobs are so much more secure and our employment and financial security is so much more secure because we have control and we have the knowledge to be able to diversify our income thanks to the internet. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we've always thought in, you think a little bit outside the box, not the traditional stream. And how many people did we hear about uh, around the world and in more traditional job settings? And we were able to do just fine. So you can... You have the, this is my inspirational moment. <laughs> you have the power and you're, you know, you're smart enough to use what you have available to you. Um, even though it may sound like a lot of work at first, even though it may sound like it's risky, do your research and also just try what's the worst thing that could happen if you want to start a little side hustle online and maybe that'll grow into something amazing down the line. You are so in, in control. So in terms of where I, see myself or what I saw this job being when I was younger, it didn't exist. But it makes, um, when I think about all of the things that I wanted to check off, this definitely meets all of them. And so that's really cool growing up and knowing, oh, I kind of did that. You know, I I maintained those yeah. those values that I set out for myself and those those checklist items. Yeah, no, that's cool. I mean, it is it is very fulfilling when you can feel that way, when you've done things that you've you you dreamt about doing and then you were able to accomplish them like you i i kind of feel fortunate to be able to say that about myself when it comes to yeah. a lot of different things in life you know but at the same time there's always still i wonder if you feel this at times too where there's that you know when you're you're thinking about okay what's next what's next like how do i like you said earlier how do i you know keep yeah. you know building this thing up how do i stay relevant because as you know you know there's so many changes with with where people are spending their time online like are people still consuming long form youtube content the same way they did or are they now spending that that time scrolling through their tiktok feed and watching 10 minutes worth of short form content yeah you know at a at a regular basis so but that i guess that's just kind of you know i guess to get deep here that's just part of life right? it's stressful yeah yeah it's part of it's part of what we do and that makes it scary but it's also what makes it exciting because we know that five years from now, whatever we're making is going to be different. Yes. Um, there's always a, ch- a challenge to overcome and that keeps it exciting. It, it keeps it stressful, but it keeps that fire going to, you know, keep keep going a little bit. And I think, you know, that might be why a lot of people get bored in other jobs because mm-hmm. they kind of they're they're doing the same thing every day. And so a lot of us you know, we do this and you and I in this situation because we love it. And it's first and foremost, it's fun and we enjoy it. I don't think we we started doing this because we're like, oh, yeah, we're going to make tons of money. Oh, yeah. That's that's like the wrong reason to go into it, too, because you're (laughs) you're going into it for like these reasons that are so vapid and superficial and you're not doing it for the sake of doing it. Right. Like it it, and and Mm -hmm. it's not sustainable long term. Yeah. Yeah, because when you're not and hitting those, when you're not hitting those metrics of like, am I getting like more and more followers and millions of people watching me and and whatnot, like it it becomes th- then your your self esteem is tied to that, right? Yeah, the metrics are dangerous. The analytics are a dangerous place to live in. Mm-hmm. But it's it you know we always 
we're a generation that we feed off of instant gratification. Yes. We, we see those numbers and we go, that means we're successful. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, kind of not stepping back from that now that, I mean, it's something I can only do because we've been doing it for this long. There is a certain amount of, yeah, I need to hit those metrics or those numbers or get that many views to know that people are still watching and yes. there's growth happening. But tying your – and this is something – I'm throwing Chris under the bus. This is something he has to work on a lot because he ties his his value as a person to – how successful he is. And then that success is tied to numbers and mm. metrics and analytics and that you can't live in that place. You need to know who you are and what your value is as a human being. And a lot of us that for a lot of us, you know, our our work success or business success is a part of that because that's important to us, but it can't be the only thing. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think what you're saying there about metrics, of course, you can't totally ignore them. Right. But at the same time, right. It's like the stock market. You wouldn't want to be tracking the daily fluctuations of the stock market. Otherwise, you would have a heart attack when like one day it exactly. loses like 2% and then the next day it goes up. It can't up, go like this. goes 5%. It's like a... Yeah. But if you're yeah. looking at it like over an extended period of time, maybe like a year over, like month to month or quarterly or something like that, then that gives you a good, yeah. gives you a good range or a good gauge for that. And you know, yeah. something else, Lizzie, that comes to mind with a lot of things that you're talking about that I wanted to ask you about is just, you seem to have a really good relationship with ambiguity and uncertainty. And I think that is something that, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's something that, that, uh, you're welcome. But that's something that a lot of creators have to really embrace ultimately, right? Especially yeah. as they're getting started, because there is no telling whether or not you're going to become the next Lizzie Pierce or the next Chris Howe, or even like, Mr. Beast, you know, you, yeah. it, it, there's no, there's no, there's no like, you know, firm indicator on that. And so I don't know for you how, I imagine that's still, that that's something that you're still, you, you have a grasp of, but you know that you're still learning a lot in terms of how yeah. to be better with it, sitting with it. I think, yeah, I, I think a lot of what I've learned about that is tied to, I reference a lot of, about what I've learned about mental health mm -hmm. because I think that helps me approach a lot of my work problems mm -hmm. or struggles. My relationship with my anxiety is something I always work on as well. And anxiety is really rooted in the uncertainty. Sometimes it's an obsession, but usually it's the uncertainty of a situation, not being in control, not knowing how things are going to work out. And you think, well, if I worry about it, if I just obsessively think about it forever and really upset myself, that'll fix it, which makes no sense yeah. whatsoever. And that's what I try to tell my mom of all people, you know, just because you worry about it and you say, what if a thousand times doesn't stop that from potentially happening. Yeah. So if it does, oh, well, if it doesn't, oh, well, there's absolutely nothing we can do in between the, those two points. And there's, you know, it's not a comfortable feeling for a lot of people to know that they can't do anything about the future or they don't know where they're going to end up. And they don't know that if I try this, I will end up as, you know, I will be successful. If I start a YouTube channel, I will be successful. Nobody knows that. And that's why, like you just mentioned, you can't have that as a goal. Mm -hmm. Not only is that not going to, it won't fulfill you. It won't get you anywhere. You won't have any fun. You won't make anything you're proud of. None of the things that are actually important in that process are going to happen. So in my situation, in starting my channel, my my goal was, okay, first of all, I have a time goal of I'm going to do this for, I think I said three months or six months or something. Mm -hmm. And my my ultimate goal is just to be another female on the platform in the photo video niche, just to show that I'm here and to take up space on the internet. And so if anyone finds my videos, especially a young business owner, especially a young woman, they can see, oh, you know, here's another person or woman doing this. And that's amazing to see. And now maybe they can imagine themselves in my shoes doing, you know, in this job, because it's when you see, why do we call people, you know, a fireman or a policeman? We've always seen men in those roles traditionally. Mm -hmm. um, we think of camera men. We think of, you know, a lot of male producers. And because traditionally, like if we go way back, it's a lot of men in the workforce and women are still, you know, we're, we're showing up every day and 
trying to make our space in here. And it's hard to imagine yourself doing something if you don't see someone like you doing it. So that was my goal was I just want to show myself in the way I am doing this job Mm -hmm. so that it inspires hopefully other women to do the same thing. And when you reach that goal or when you see that change happening and knowing you're participating in that, that's why you show up every day. Mm -hmm. That's the point. But again, going back to your your uncertainty of what's going to happen in the long run, I sometimes it's a little bit of ignorance. Sometimes it's a little bit of you just don't think about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and sometimes it's accepting whatever the outcome is and knowing that it'll be fine either way and having the confidence in yourself. You know, I'm a smart person. I work hard. I will be fine no matter what happens. I will figure it out. And that that's it. But Chris and I make that joke a lot. Will, because his dad says it all the time. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He doesn't plan. He goes, every time we try to plan a time, he's like, yeah, yeah, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that's a laid back approach to life and it's the healthy place to live sometimes. Yeah. Because you can only control so much. I mean, I think you can control your effort. You can control, you know, the actions or the tasks that you decide to, to take. But like you said, you can't really control the outcomes re- realistically. You, right. you kind of have to be more more process oriented uh, or oriented, especially, you know, I imagine that's something that you tell people who, who come to you and say, hey, I want to start a YouTube channel. Like it's it's better to focus more on, well, What's the process that you're going to develop so that you can keep doing this over a sustained period of time? And especially when it gets hard, because there are those yeah. moments where it's going to get challenging and you're not going to want to feel like doing it. But if you have a structure or a process in place, you'll still be able mm-hmm. to show up in those in those like dark moments. Yeah. And I we treat it like a job mm-hmm. as well. Whenever people go, hey, I want to start a YouTube channel. What do I need to do? Obviously, one of the first things is consistency. You need to find a way to be consistent and and show up and not everything you make is going to be great, but that doesn't matter. Do your best every time and you need meaning behind what you're doing. You need a, a reason. You need a motivation. And then you have to find a way to enjoy it. So do you like what you're making? Are are you are there some ideas of of things that you want to make that you want to try? What is going to keep you excited? And if you're not excited, okay, then you need to make something else and you need to change it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's those are usually the first three things that I mentioned. <laughs> and yeah, you, friends help. Friends help, but you're going to have to find different things to motivate you when you're not excited about it. And luckily I have my editor Josh and he's been great because he shows up every day and usually he shows up even earlier than I do because I'm not good at waking up in the morning these days. <laughs> Can't hear me. Um, <laughs> he's hard at work. He, yeah. He's one of those people that he helps motivate me every day because he's excited to to show up and, and work and he's got a positive attitude and, and together we, we plug forward and, and it's kind of like putting one foot in front of the other and then eventually you're walking. Yeah. How big is your team now? You know, what, what does, what, what did it, when did, and also when Not did you, <laughs> when did you start to, to, to actually like hire out people? What was the moment that you said, okay, I think we need to actually hire some help here because this is getting to be a little bit too much on, on our ends. Yeah. With our production company, we were always kind of hiring people on contract and for specific jobs. Mm. So when the idea of hiring someone full time for anyone is like, oh my God, how am I going to do that? financially, what is that going to look like? You know, am am I hiring the right person? I don't know how to do this. With Josh, it was a very natural integration because he started editing some of my vlogs when I was doing weekly vlogs for a while. Mm-hmm. And then when COVID happened, I decided to stop those because there wasn't a lot to film of my daily life. But I didn't feel right going, okay, you're out of some work. Yeah. Surprise. Yeah. You know, in the middle of a pandemic. So I said, okay, why don't you help me with my YouTube videos? And he wasn't doing all of them. He was just going to help in whatever capacity I did. I decided. And then there was one really busy month after, you know, I think it was six months of him kind of helping part time. And there was one really busy month. I said, could I book you for the entire next month? And then after that, it was still getting busier. I said, okay, why don't we just decide that January you're going to start full time? And we discussed a rate and it was very gradual. And now I can't imagine a time that I didn't have him because he is the best and most important part of my business for sure. I have a part-time assistant who I, we just transitioned actually out of 
Um, I think originally you were even talking to Jessica. Yes. And now I have Maddie. Yeah. So hopefully Maddie sticks around for a long time. Jess was in school, so she had to eventually kind of go back into her schoolwork. Yep. And now that I have someone doing that, I can't imagine not having someone help. You know, it's it's one of those things where you don't realize how much you can outsource and how much you do need help until it's there. And you're like, wow, if I had to do that, I don't know how I would figure it out mm-hmm. at this point. And financially, it does sound scary and like a bit of a risk, but things usually go up instead of down. <laughs> yeah. You know, more money usually comes in when you hire out than not because you have help and you can do more and you can do your job better. And, you know, Chris and I are, Chris also has an editor. He does not have an assistant. Could he use one? 1,000%. <laughs> By the way, is Chris in the room with you while you say these things? No. Okay. <laughs> no. No, but he he knows how I feel. Yeah. He knows how That's I feel. Good. I would only say it now because I've said it to his face. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. And so it, and a lot of times there, there's no rule book to this business like we've discussed. So figuring out what that next role is going to be and what's most important is something that we think about in the back of our heads a lot going, I don't have time to do this. I don't have capacity to, to do this. What would really help in this process? What would speed it up? And we think about that for a long time before then making the next hire. Right, right. Well, speaking of Chris, you know, we've we've talked about him a little bit here. I should give some context for people who are listening. Of course, your husband is Chris Howe, who is another, you know, yes. popular YouTuber in in the, you know, filmmaking niche. I I'm curious about just how that how that relationship works in terms of being able to work together on a business while also being married to each other. You know, is mm-hmm. it is there really is there a balance between the two? Like, or, or or do you find that there are, are seasons where you two are very focused on work and the on the collaboration, the interactions between you two are are work related, and then there are seasons where hey, we're focused on our wedding, we're planning that. This is our personal life that mm-hmm. that's happening. It's become first of all, we have a podcast about this exact subject. Mm. Um, we've taken a pause from it, but there's lots of good episodes there if you guys want to check it out. It's called A Couple of Creatives. And that's literally what we talk about. We sometimes interview other creators that are in relationships as well. It Right now, where in the current landscape of our businesses, it's the easiest it's ever been because Chris is across the hall managing his YouTube channel. I am across on the other side of the hall managing mine. So there isn't too much of us actually together anymore unless it's something that is – uh, we're working on together for the our joint production company. Mm. So it's fairly separate. Um, what we are working on together are usually travel opportunities as well. And usually that's Chris and I going to a destination filming while we're there, coming back, um, either editing the content ourselves or hiring out another editor to help with that or editing photos, et cetera. So the way it used to be when we were running our production company and that was all we were doing, no YouTube channels, it was Chris and I, nobody else. <laughs> doing everything ourselves. At first, yeah, there was a lot of friction and that was, it's tough to find the line of, okay, when are we business Chris and Lizzie? And when are we, you know, Chris and Lizzie who love each other? And I was better at that at times than Chris because he would think, you know, if I got upset about something work-related, he would take it very personally. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm not yelling at you, the person. I'm yelling at the stupid thing you did on <laughs> in this email. You know, don't don't get so upset about it if you can. And it it requires a lot of good communication at the end of the day to talk about this, you know, thing that you did upset me. Or you know, at five o'clock we don't talk about work anymore. We're just, you know, we're we're just a couple right now. We really have to actively try to not talk about work. And uh, you have to be clear about those. I want to say deadlines, but I don't think that's the right word. Those boundaries, lines. boundaries, boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for sure. I, I you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I've, I've listened lately to a lot of listening to, I don't know if you know, Esther Perel, listen to her. Uh, it sounds familiar. She is a uh, very popular psychoanalyst, psychologist, mm. I believe. Uh, great stuff. She talks a lot about relationships. And when I was listening to her podcast, called Where Should We Begin? I think it's on Spotify now, the newest episodes, and then there's other Mm -hmm. older episodes on on Audible. But there are these conversations that she has with, you know, her patients. They've obviously given their consent and they're talking about their relationships. And you just realize that there's, you know, the the picture, the the portrait that we we get about relationships from movies, you know, like romantic comedies are always just like 
how yeah. the relationship begins. But then there's never really yeah. like the stories of, well, how does that, how do you keep that going? <laughs> right. Yeah. Like there's not, there hasn't been yeah. that much content or, or, or things on that. And I think that's where, you know, people like yourself, you and your husband, Chris, being so open about some of those things on YouTube is, is serving as like an example for people who are trying to sort that out themselves. I hope so. I, I try to make sure that we are never the typical, I mean, everybody hates this word, quote unquote, influencers, Yeah, where we pretend like everything's great all the time and life is awesome. And it doesn't mean I also want to sit on camera and cry about everything that's really hard. I just want to be honest about, you know, yeah, we bicker. Everybody does. No, everything is not perfect. Yes, it's hard to find time to, you know, cuddle when things are stressful. Yes, it's, you know, all of those things are true. But at the same time, Chris and I talk a lot about how we don't know how our relationship would work sometimes if we had different jobs. Mm. Because we know exactly what the other person is dealing with. We have a lot of, we work with a lot of the same people. And so it's really nice to go, I don't know what to charge for this, or I'm having this issue with a client. Do you know what I should do? That part is really nice to be able to confide in someone, confide in someone who 100% understands it. And so because of that, the, the good things about us working together and, and being in a relationship outweigh the downsides mm. by a long shot for, for us. Yeah. Because we also, communication is the biggest part. I think it is in any relationship, but especially if you work together. But anyone who is in a relationship, you are working together because you're now your financials are tied together. You have to run a house or wherever you live. You we have pets, so there's shared responsibility in keeping them alive and healthy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Eventually, we will have children, and we have to decide how we're going to parent them. Where are they going to go to school? What what are our values in raising a human? And now our latest discussion is, you know, no, we're not we're not trying to have kids for anyone who cares. We are not trying to do that. <laughs> but we of course talk about it. And what that's going to look like, because we work out of our house right now, how is that going to work if a child is crying and we want to record a podcast? Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> well, you could, if you have a child, if we do this, uh, do a part two or I'm something. I'm just holding a baby. And you yeah. have, you have, you have a, a newborn child or something. You can have them, on, yeah, right? have them on camera too. I have no problem just with that. Just burping my baby. Exactly. I mean, I would love it for Chris to be able to take it if I'm doing this kind of thing, you know? But what if he has Maybe to Josh can do a little bit of the babysitting. Maybe Josh can babysit, yeah. <laughs> What do you think? He can't hear me. <laughs> I, I, yeah, like there, I'd have no idea how that's going to work. And that is 100% something that is relationship and work based because we work out of our house. Yeah. And so are we going to have to get a, a nanny? Are we going to have to get a separate office space? Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, um, what was it that I was going to say to you? It's just, Gosh, I think I just totally lost my train of thought there. There was something that I was going to ask you. It's that kind of day. Yeah. <laughs> Related to that. It's, well, at least you're like half, you're at midday. I'm here on in California. So I'm on the, I'm just kind of starting my day here. So I got to be a little bit quicker oh, on my thanks feet. For, <laughs> thanks for waking up for me. <laughs> yeah, no problem. No problem at all. Um, I'll get back to it if I remember it. Sure. But, you know, on that note of working with, you know, having a husband who has a shared experience. Oh, I remember now. I re totally remember what it is. Um, Go for it. Having someone like Chris, who is also a creator like yourself, I it's it seems like it just gives you another opportunity to get the repetitions in to become the most actualized version of a couple that you can be, right? Like it's just another, it's mm. another area in which, oh, this is something we can get the practice in of like, how to be communicate with each other, how to like deal with conflict yeah. better, you know, because you listed all those things, right? Dealing with your pets, your house, mm -hmm. you, you, potentially having children. It's mm -hmm. just another area in which, you know, you can, it, it helps you master the art of being in a partnership mm -hmm. with someone. And honestly, a lot of those things are harder than just running a business together in a lot of ways mm -hmm. because they're, they're rooted in your, your morals and your values and for some couples religion and it's those are really big you know philosophical life questions, questions. whereas you know deciding whether we want to take a job or not take a job is totally i don't know i'm trying to think of the word see even my brain is slow <laughs> today it's it's not 
it's not as important. It's like incon. It's as, yeah, it's inconsequential because like inconsequential. At, at the end yeah. of the day, there's gonna be other jobs. Like if you if you got an offer to to say fly to Aruba or something and do a video for their tourism board, and you said yeah. no to that, well, you know, Saint Croix is gonna come calling like maybe a couple months yeah. later. You know, but ironically, you know, it's kind of more important in some ways for us. Are we gonna are we gonna redo our kitchen or not? Because <laughs> that's expensive. It's expensive. <laughs> are we gonna like it? Who are we gonna pick? We won't be able to eat in the kitchen. Like that stresses me out way more than deciding whether we would take a job in Aruba. Yeah. Aruba sounds great. I don't care if I go or not, but I'm really stressed about renovating <laughs> my kitchen because I've never done that. Mm -hmm. Done this Aruba job many times. So uh yeah, it's some things that sound easy are sometimes harder. In relationships, I can see. And I mean, a lot of men are probably like, oh, I don't really care about the kitchen. But I'm like, Chris cares about what the kitchen looks like. Oh, yeah. And he definitely cares how much the kitchen costs to renovate. <laughs> yeah. I, well, for I, I mean, feel free to take a pass on this question if you if you would like. But I'm really curious, like who who, yeah. who of the two of you is more budget conscious when it comes to paying for things and buying things? We've asked each other that question. I don't have to pass. Um and it's it's hard to to pick one of us because we have and again something that helps our relationship work is we have a lot of the same philosophies and the same feelings towards how we want to spend money and what's important for us and what isn't and we talk a lot about that so i i would say we we're both guilty of spending um money on silly things mm -hmm. sometimes and we both like nice things we <laughs> we both i have a slight purse obsession and he has a slight watch, watch obsession mm. and uh you know can't can't help that but we also both don't uh we'll tell each other i really don't think you should get that that seems really silly or um it and we also know it's important for both of us to participate equally in investments mm -hmm. like the house and our car and mostly that's because of me is because i feel really uncomfortable if i don't own half of something and that's something i'm working on i guess mm -hmm. i'm like this isn't my house too it is half mine the end um <laughs> <laughs> so that that is there is no situation in which you know it will not be half owned by me so i wouldn't say like one of us is more budget conscious than the other because we're both kind of we're both similar. We both have good w good things we do when saving, and we both have not so good things that we do. But I mean, Chris is older, so he's had a little bit more time to do some more research on you know investing and things like that than I am. Mm -hmm. So financially, he's probably more financially savvy than I am. But uh, I think that just comes with time as well. Yeah, yeah. This usually is. I mean, I I can remember when I was in my early twenties, thinking to myself. You know, I'll figure that stuff out. You know, one, maybe once I get into my yeah, 30s. Now exactly. that I'm in my 30s, you know, I have I, that time has finally come where I said, yeah, I got to pay attention to this and sort out what kind of retirement plan I have and where am I, you know, yeah. putting my money and things like that. It it all ends up kind of, you know, yeah. working itself out in the end. Yeah, exactly. And it it gives me a lot more anxiety, I think, than it gives him. I think ever, some people have that kind of financial anxiety where they're like, oh, I don't want to check my visa bill today or I don't want to think about investing. That really freaks me out or it makes me anxious. But ultimately, you know, going from my mid-20s to my late 20s, I've re since that has become important to me, I've realized that it's more – I'll feel better and more in control if I just look or do the research or read a book about it or whatever. Yeah. And so, Yeah. Yeah, no, that's part, that's definitely part of it. Just being able to, you know, not necessarily what we talked about earlier. You can't necessarily control the outcome of where your money is going to go, if it'll go up or down, yeah. if you'll get new jobs for your production company or not. But then if you're doing, you know, the bare minimum work of educating yourself, you know, that that's the thing that is within your grasp. So mm -hmm. more power to you on, on that end. I think that that's when it becomes scary for people mm -hmm. is when they don't know, when they feel like they don't know anything about it. Yeah. So the more you educate yourself, the more in control you'll feel. Definitely. Definitely. Well, to shift gears here, you know, as we get closer to closing out this conversation, there is something I wanted to ask you about another thing that you had mentioned a little bit earlier, and that was just 
you know, having mentors, building a support group for yourself. And, you know, you do have a good support group of fellow creators who can, you know, who, yeah. who know what you go through, right? You have your husband, you mentioned your friends with Peter McKinnon. I, I mean, you, there's a, there's a community of people there that you, that you have who can, who have like shared experiences of what you've gone through. And so I'm curious about finding that community, especially as you're, you're just getting started or, or maybe you're like, you know, half, you're, you're, you're a little bit new to the journey you've started, but you haven't yet met people. How did you go about finding and connecting with all these, these people in your life? Yeah, everyone on YouTube is really friendly, you'll realize. <laughs> I've noticed that too. Um, I've noticed that too, yeah, doing these podcasts. Especially, yeah, in the field we're in, um, there isn't a lot of uh, competitiveness, which is really nice. Everyone is very supportive and wants to lift each other up and do collabs and shoot together and make cool things. And it's... And I know that it's not necessarily that exact way in some other niches on YouTube from what I've heard. I don't know, mm -hmm. but I'm not involved in those. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, luckily everyone is really friendly and we all just kind of s slide slowly into each other's DMs and we talk a little bit there and ask questions and everyone's really open about it. And there are a few photographers who I've never met that I actually should be meeting one this weekend. Um, her name is Anita Sadowska. Mm. And I've never met her, but we've talked online for, I don't know, a year or so, like just in DMs and going, oh, I love this thing that you did. Or, oh, could you tell me more about this? And, and that kind of thing. And finally, we're going to end up at the same event. And we may... We're also just everyone's just really open about inviting each other on trips and things like that if they can go more like photography centered trips. And but if you if you don't have anyone like that um, or you have a lot of friends online and you want more in person, I, everyone thinks there is a large community of YouTubers in Toronto and there is to some extent. But a lot of the people I'm closest with are in the States mm. or in other countries. Yeah. So um, if you if you're looking for people who are close by, I would say use, you know, tell everybody that you know online and in person what you do and just be open to hanging out with people and invite them like if someone you meet at a coffee shop shoots say oh we should go shoot together sometime get each other's numbers you know it's it's networking just being open to making making new friends and going on um, a lot of people who were on our azores trip we did a couple of years ago have stayed in touch well, Lizzie, thank you so much for again for joining me on uh, this episode of the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky. This was a very fun and enlightening episode to uh, to have you on. And uh, before we go, um, obviously, would love for you to to share anything that you're working on or or promote anything that you'd like to promote. You know, as we wrap up here. Sure. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. If you have no idea who I am, please check out my YouTube channel. It's just my name, Lizzie Pierce. And my Instagram, same thing. We are working on a couple of really cool videos this month. They're not out yet, but keep an eye out because they are very cool. One of them is kind of a short documentary, and I don't want to say too much about it. I wish I could, but uh, keep an eye out for that. I think you guys will really be into it. Very cool. Well, thank you so much again. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Once again, thank you so much to Lizzie Pierce for joining me on this episode of the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky. We've got links to everything that we discuss in the show notes, so make sure to check that out at www.videocraftshow.com. The notes again for this episode will be posted there. Quick reminder for all of you, if you are struggling to organize and script your ideas, we do have a resource for you. Just get a copy of our free scripting template. You can get that delivered straight to your inbox when you sign up to our email list just go to videocraftshow.com to subscribe to that also want to as always thank my team for helping me to produce this particular episode and all other episodes of the video craft show presented by video husky shout out to nikki vicente and ingrid sariba as well as paulo lopez on graphics for all the work that they do and that's gonna do it for this edition, for this episode of the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky, make sure to tune in in two weeks when we'll have another interview, another episode. But until then, feel free to reach out to us at any point in time. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.